The Utah lake shores were like a mirror, as smooth as glass, and lay all day like molten silver. Albert Carrington, member of Lieutenant John W. Gunnison's survey crew, 1850. Stretching 24 miles long and 12 miles across, Utah Lake is a canvas of natural beauty and year-round recreation. It is the largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi River, with a past as colorful and vital as the state that serves as its home. For centuries, many people have had a special bond with Utah Lake. For some, that bond was based on necessity. For others, their affection for the lake has been rooted in pure fun. As long as the lake kept giving, more people gathered to receive her contributions. But today, many people don't realize the historical value of Utah Lake and the vital role it continues to play in our society. At the end of the Great Ice Age, Lake Bonneville formed in the Great Basin. The lake receded, leaving several habitable valleys behind, one of them being Utah Valley, probably the choicest valley for human habitation in the whole Great Basin. And one of the things that made it the area that was most favorable to habitation was Utah Lake. Utah Lake provided fish, it provided a place for wildlife, there were berries, there were pine nuts near at hand, the mountains provided wild game, and it was just an area that beckoned for man to arrive. From the earliest archaic period to the Paleo, Fremont, and Ute Indian bands, her tributaries and surrounding land have provided food and shelter for birds, animals, and humans alike. Spanish explorers, fur trappers and traders, and Mormon pioneers have also been her beneficiaries. Each thrived off the ecosystem of the lake, and all were connected by it. Utah Lake literally nourished the growth of Utah. Ancestors of the Ute were the people who were here when Escalante arrived in 1776. He climbed a, a hill at the mouth of Spanish Fork Canyon, looked down into the valley and saw a resource that uh, he marveled over. Fifty years after Escalante arrived, fur trappers began arriving in Utah in quest of beaver peltry. And a guy named uh, Daniel Potts came through in 1827. He left the best description of Utah Valley. He found the, uh, the valley dissected by transparent streams, uh, he found the Indians camped in what he called houses that looked like muskrat huts because they lived away from the timber and so they made their houses of bulrushes from Utah Lake and they lived primarily on fish. Our route today lay along the border of Utah Lake. The scenery around was magnificent. The wide-capped peaks only rivaled in purity by the clouds overhanging them. I have read of lakes Como and Lehman, but think they cannot surpass the romance nature has spread around this beautiful sheet. Joseph P. Hamelin, November 7, 1849. John C. Fremont was a government trapper who came through Utah in 1845 he wrote a report when he returned to Washington, and uh, in that report, he touted the virtues of Utah Valley. He said it was a great area for stock raising. It was an area where you could raise grain, and the Mormon pioneers read what he wrote about the Great Basin. And so when they were looking for a place to call their home uh, and read Fremont's reports, 
they were impressed with what they saw, and I guess they were probably impressed most by the fact that nobody else was here except the Native American tribes, and they wanted some place where they could be off by themselves. Jim Bridger met them in Wyoming near the Big Sandy River and talked to them about the Great Basin. In his opinion, Utah Valley was the place to go. But there was one drawback, and that was the Ute Indians inhabited Utah Valley, and they were very tenacious about their land, their fish, and their game. So he advised Brigham Young to stay clear of them for a while. So when the Mormons came into the valley, instead of turning and going south down toward uh, Utah Lake, they turned north and went up toward the Great Salt Lake to form their initial settlement. The 19th century ushered in waves of pioneer families. Many of the valley's early residents stared starvation in the face. In 1848, fishing companies were organized to collect fish for desperate settlers who were without provisions. Were it not for the plentiful fish in Utah Lake, hundreds of settlers might not have survived. So during the winter of 40. 748, uh, many people were going hungry in Salt Lake Valley. And then when the uh, crops began to sprout in the spring, the crickets harvested them uh, early, along with the early frost, killed them. And they found themselves in need of food in a hurry, and they wondered what to do. Parley P. Pratt suggested that they send a fishing party to Utah Lake. The Utah Fishing Company was chartered they did catch fish in Utah Lake, and they took it back to Salt Lake, and it helped the people make it through the difficult times caused by the frost and crickets. Two families, the Madsons and the Loys, dominated the commercial fishing industry on Utah Lake for nearly a century. In fact, Milo's great-grandfather was the one that uh, brought sayings from over in Denmark where he came from and and was able to uh, teach the people how to fish. They would salt down the fish and put them away, kept them from starving to death. They could take enough fish home to last them all winter. And that was their main source of food. I'd hate to have to eat just that all winter, but I guess when you're hungry, you'll eat anything. While the Madsen family is no longer actively involved in commercial fishing on Utah Lake, the Loys continue even today. I've actually commercial fishing, so I was with my father. Went out and even helped him at the age of nine years old. And I'm, I'm uh, 78 years old right now. At one time on Utah Lake, there were 13 licensed commercial fishermen. There's more product shipped out of the Railway Express in Provo than any other product in the county. That was uh, corp and suckers. I was first introduced to Utah Lake by my father when I was just a little boy, and I've been down there ever since on the fishing boats and just took over the business from him when he retired. Fourth generation commercial fisherman. My great-great-grandfather started the business, Brigham Young, commissioned him to catch fish for the pioneers. Fish were not only a means for survival, they also became a means of exchange. Provo LDS church records show that at least 6,795 pounds of fish were donated as tithing. In turn, church workers constructing the Salt Lake Temple were paid in fish, many of which were gathered from Utah Lake. Word spread about the lake's generous offerings of fish, and fishermen from neighboring valleys descended upon the area. But who could blame these hungry pioneers after hearing stories of being able to pluck tasty trout or sucker out of the water with your bare hands, or being able to catch all you wanted by simply dragging an unbaited hook through the water? 
Indeed, so great was the number of suckers and mullets passing continuously upstream that often the river would be full from bank to bank as thick as they could swim for hours and sometimes days together. George Washington Bean, 1854 even in the 1880s, the population of Junesucker, one of the lake's native and predominant fish species, likely ran into the millions. However, life was anything but easy for the early pioneers. Motivated by hunger and the will to survive, settlers fished frequently and recklessly. During those intensive times of fishing in 1855 and 56, they were fishing during the spawning season and they were hauling in everything that they could because the need, need for food was so great. They were using gill nets, and it caught everything, the big fish, the smaller fish. Soon, community leaders began to realize they were about to exhaust a seemingly endless resource. Laws were written to regulate fishing methods and to control the number of fish being taken from the lake. They were fishing day and night, Finally, in one of the Provo meetings, one of the authorities, one of the, the state president of Provo had to get up and say, brethren, we want you in meeting on Sundays, and we want you sleeping at nights, so we want you to take the nets out of the river on Sundays and during the nighttime, so some of the fish can come up, uh, go up the stream, and we'll have fish in succeeding years. Then as now, fishing was not only a necessity, it was a pleasure. It wasn't uncommon for anglers to land a 20-pound cutthroat trout. Today, fishermen pull largemouth bass, walleye, and white bass from Utah Lake. Channeled catfish are also plentiful and have been known to grow extremely large. A 32-pound, 8-ounce cat was pulled from the water as recently as 1978. Utah Lake has always been generous. As the pioneers settled in and communities started springing up around the lake, residents soon realized that the lake had more than life-sustaining food to offer them. Resorts started up on the Great Salt Lake and the people in Utah County took their cue from them and began resorts uh, in Utah County on Utah Lake in the 1870s and 80s, some of the earlier ones uh, like Saratoga, uh, were begun in some form or another in the 70s, but most of them uh, really took off during the 80s and 90s, and we had uh, uh, maybe 20 resorts surrounding the lake. So no matter what side of the lake you lived on, there was a place to go and bathe, meet with people. They did a lot of dancing. There were parties down there. There were pavilions for people to picnic under. They held dances there, and I can remember a great deal of, of uh, when they uh, would do these dances all the time. And I remember that's where I remember uh, I learned to do the Charleston. It was a lot of fun. I thought that was just wonderful. Many of the resorts had their own pools, which were fed by warm springs. People had their choice of either swimming in the lake or they could swim in the pools. Uh, you could take your choice. Some of the pools were enclosed. Most of them were outdoor pools like at Geneva and, and Saratoga. There were ball fields there. Next to the Provo Lake Resort, there was a racetrack where people went down and, and uh, indulged in betting on horses a little bit. They, they had evening programs. They had live orchestras that played. Um, most of the resorts had some kind of a little restaurant, but it was a, it was a place to go and mingle. Uh, later on, uh, again, uh, after the airplane age was introduced to Utah Valley, we had people flying into the resorts, landing on the sandy beaches, and selling airplane rides to some of the customers uh, who were at the resort. At Geneva, there was a great slide that we'd carry our carts up, we'd walk up all these stairs carrying this cart, and hook it in a rail, 
and then slide down a steep grade and scoot it out over the water. Uh, if you got, if it was too front heavy, you dive down in the water. If it was back heavy, why well, you, you went this way. But that's where I spent my young life, uh, going to celebrations and dances and swimming and so forth. During the resort heyday of the early 20th century, excursion boats, such as the SS Showboat and Renon W, set sail, taking passengers around to all of the lake resorts, out for a romantic dinner party cruise, or to dance to the orchestra on board. The showboat was a, I dream of my father and his good friend Elmer Smith. My father's name was Hewitt Strong. They called the boat the Smith and Strong Showboat. And it was 32 feet wide, 90 feet long. But they had to be able to build a boat that flowed in 14 or 16 inches of water and yet hold old people. So it was a flat bottom boat. So when they got the boat finished, and then they started advertising for parties and stuff, it, it didn't it take long, it became very popular. In fact, the last few years it run, it was booked up for a year in advance for the, all the weekends and a lot of the weekdays. And uh, I remember taking my girl on this excursion when I was 17, and it was so romantic to be out there on that boat with your girlfriend. Uh, I was wishing I was old enough to be married. <laughs> it had a stage at one end of the boat and a, a kitchen and restrooms, and uh, people would perform on the stage uh, different vaudeville acts and so forth for the uh, paying customers. And then they had large dances on the boat. Sometimes they had over 200 people on that boat, and it was a very nominal fee. You could uh, go down, ride the boat, take your loved one out for a ride under the uh, starry skies above Utah Lake, and uh, dance away the evening for like 50 cents, something uh, in that area. There wasn't very much entertainment in Provo at the time. We had uh, two or three motion picture uh, uh, theaters and uh, several bars, and that was about it. So uh, Smith and Strong cashed in on what was a need for entertainment. Grand times were had both on and off the SS showboat. Aquatic programs were often staged for passengers. Indeed, the SS Showboat and Utah Lake were bright lights in the dark times of the Great Depression. A favorite destination for boat passengers was Bird Island. It was just six miles from the mouth of the Provo River, but at a cruising speed of eight miles per hour, a round trip and a short visit to the island to look for bird eggs could take up to four hours. If you walk through there, you had to watch for your step because they leave their eggs right in the rocks. And they take people out there and we tell them, be careful where you step. We took hundreds of people out there and they was, uh, they'd walk down the, we'd go down the south side and they'd walk up the Long Peninsula into the bird area. So that island has been a very, very important place. Even right now, the biggest catfish and the biggest carp and everything else is right by the island. It's been used by uh, fishermen and duck hunters uh, heavily through the years. And of course, it was a drying card for people who wanted to see something as strange as an island in Utah Lake when they rode out on the showboat. Utah Lake was, and still is, a marvelous place for the nature enthusiast and sportsman. The lake is home to an array of waterfowl many that migrate from the western Canadian prairies. Buffleheads and mergansers can be found in the marshes around her shoreline. It's just great to see all this wildlife. That's always been a big love of mine on this lake. I fish all around the lake. In fact, if we can't find fish in one place, we usually just move from harbor to harbor to harbor or beach to beach. And uh, we may cover three, four, five, six places on the lake in a, in a day. Uh, so I fish the lake about 20 times a year on the average since I was about uh, 12 years old. It's uh, treated me real good. The coolest thing about Utah Lake is that it probably has more different kinds of fish and fishermen than any other lake in the state of Utah. 
we like to fish this lake year round and the fish are just outstanding. It attracts a great diversity of people. The main reason I come down here really isn't to fish. I really enjoy fishing and catching walleye and all these other fish, but you know, the most fun is, is visiting with uh, people, coming down here with friends and just a great lake to come and, and just recreate on. Some who grew up around Utah Lake have rarely left her side. Leaving the lake, in their minds, would be like losing an old friend. Don Hawk has lived every one of his 91 years here. I live now within two blocks of where I was born. And I have lived that, uh, lived not, not much further than that all my life. We moved up by the park. That's the furthest, furthest I've been from where I was born. We used to go swimming down the lake all the time. What we used to do is go, go skinny dipping. We built a little sailboat and used to go out in, the, out in the lake on that. I remember one time they had a 4th of July, uh, the fireworks down to the lake. And we went out, uh, we, we, we got us a boat and went out and watched the fireworks out on the, from, from out in the lake. We used to, uh, well, in the wintertime, we ice skated down there. That was, uh, we, we ice skated uh, out to Bird Island many times. Ice skating was marvelous. I remember all through my high school years, we used to skate down there. We could skate as far as Bird Island and back and sometimes the ice would be so clear. And then other times, of course, the waves underneath would uh, create a disturbance. And quite often it would break up. And as young people will that are daring, we would jump the cracks of, of the ice as they split open and we'd jump from one to the other. It's a wonder we didn't drown, but we didn't. And so it, it proved to be just a wonderful uh, winter time for a lot of us. Roland Strong inherited his father's love of Utah Lake and was one of the first to surf its waters. But the water sports have been good down there for years. We had a we call it a surfboard. Somebody called it an aquaplane, but the board was hooked to the boat. About a three by five piece of wood, plywood. And then you had two ropes coming back in the front. And you hook it to the boat and you could get a good ride. You could, same way as they are now. Now they, of course, they're jumping and doing flips and all this stuff, but you could do the same speed on a, on a turn. You had to get back onto one corner and you get that one corner and you could spray water over for a long ways. The only trouble was, if you fell off and the boat would upside down and the rope pulled from the other way, the board would dive. So you had to make sure you cut your engine fast. If somebody fell off, you had put the thing in the mud. During the late 1920s, informal speedboat races were held at Geneva Resort. And in the 1960s, Memorial Day weekend drew crowds from all over the country who reveled in watching the daring and the lightning fast captain their boats to victory. Every Memorial Day, it was boat races down at the lake. And they would start in the harbor, and they would go out into the lake and race out there and then come back in. Well, the harbor was always filled with people. It was, it was a big thing for Provo to have these boat races on Memorial Day. It was not an exceedingly great place to race, unfortunately, because it's such a shallow lake that the winds stirred up the waves and made it pretty dangerous. I think it was for the national championships. One of the drivers perished. And uh, from that time on, uh, the boat races became uh, less frequent. But during the 40s, it was a big thing. Thousands of people would go down to the old Provo Boat Harbor and watch those boat races, and it was exciting. For generations, boaters and water skiers have gathered and played on Utah Lake. But over the years, the number of people visiting the lake has slowly decreased. Today, Considering how close Utah Lake is to such a large population area, she is underutilized. For many, her enduring charm will never fade. 
the lake quietly goes on, proving her worth in countless ways. As the lake kept giving, the people kept coming. With her newfound popularity, massive changes began to take place. Urban growth, land use practices, the introduction of non-native fish, municipal and industrial discharge have impaired water quality and severely altered the lake's ecosystem. Most human civilizations are basically built around water bodies, right? They're a great transportation unit, they provide resources, water, and, and food. And I think what's basically happened is as the human pressure has been built up more and more and more around the lake, all kinds of things happen. Irrigation is a big thing, right? I mean, we basically take a lot of water out of the river, we run it over the ground to irrigate the crops, and then it goes back into the lake. What that does is it brings dirt with it, or sediments, which makes the lake turbid, it brings the phosphorus and nitrogen and all the things that the farmers put on the water to fertil or the land to fertilize it, and that basically causes algae to bloom. Uh, you've got things like Geneva Steel that operated for years and years there. It's unclear how much stuff went into the lake from the them. You know, and all these things are necessary for civilization. I'm not saying this is the fault of the farmers. I'm just saying that the way we approach things historically is to get the easiest, fastest fix we can, and then the ramifications come down the road. And we're always faced with trying to fix something that broke a long time ago. When the pioneers first arrived, they found that to, to enable them to raise crops, they had to irrigate. And they began taking water out of the, the Provo River right away. Uh, in the spring, when the sucker and the trout spawned, it was not irrigation time yet, and the fish were able to go up the river and spawn. The ones who weren't caught by the fishermen with their nets across the mouth of the river during spawning season went up and spawned. But then when the fry, small fry, began coming back down the river, it was irrigation season, and temporary dams had been put in, and the water from Provo River was diverted out onto the farmland, and thousands, right from the very first, thousands and thousands of fish were wasted every year by being caught high and dry on farmers' fields when the irrigation water was shut off. The earliest government map that was done of the Provo area showed Provo River being a braided river. Uh, in places, it, it looked just like the fingers coming off a hand, uh, especially at the base of the uh, Orem Bench, where the highway comes down from Orem into Provo now. It was just braided with streams from the Provo River. But the problem was, in, in heavy water years, when a large flow came down the river, being so many small streams in that area, it tended to flood, and a lot of the water came right down Fifth West and flooded out the town. And so they, they needed to, to begin channelizing that area fairly early to keep the water within its uh, bounds. With the linking of the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific Railroads, the West blossomed with hope and opportunity. Tradesmen of all varieties, hotel tycoons, bankers, restaurateurs, and countless other professionals descended upon Utah Lake seeking a better life and to reap the rewards promised by the area's booming population. In May 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed in Utah. Now uh, goods could be brought in to the territory. They could also be shipped out of the territory. In 1874, a branch line into Utah County was completed. That made it possible now to build a woolen mill powered by the, the Provo River, a mill race uh, coming out of the Provo River. Uh, unfortunately, the mill led to uh, a little more pollution in Utah Lake because every time they dyed the wool, uh, the excess dye was just tapped off down the mill stream. And so some days you'd have a, a blue mill stream, some days you'd have a red, some days you'd have a green. 
About the same time, sugar mills began depositing waste from the processing of sugar beets into the tributaries of the lake and the Jordan River. Sawmills were guilty too. People began building sawmills uh, up canyons, and rather than pay people to haul off the sawdust, they decided that it would be just as easy to throw it in the stream that powered the mill. The territorial legislature uh, eventually began to worry about losing the trout population and passed laws uh, that uh, forbade the mill owners from disposing of their sawdust into the waters uh, contiguous to the mill. They also passed laws making it necessary for farmers to screen the irrigation ditches, which kept uh, a large number of fish from perishing on the fields. And another law, uh, any new dam that went in, the, a fish ladder needed to be constructed uh, adjacent to that dam so fish could spawn up the Provo River and, and some of the smaller tributaries by climbing the fish ladder and continuing on up the stream. Progress occurred swiftly and without thought of future consequences to Utah Lake and the human population around it. The steel industry found a home near Utah Lake in the 1920s, beginning with Columbia Steel, which later became Geneva Steel, built just a short distance away from where Geneva Resort once stood. Along with the height of steel production came the peak of pollution. In the 1940s and 1950s, most large steelmakers were oblivious to environmental issues. One, one of the big polluters of the lake uh, has been the Geneva Steel Mill that was built in the 1940s. Uh, at first there wasn't a, a lot of uh, machinery in place to keep the polluted water from flowing into Utah Lake. University of Utah did a study, I think it was in the late 40s, early 50s. Now at that time, almost all of the communities in Utah Valley put their oh, raw sewage directly into Provo Bay and Utah Lake. And yet this study done by the University of Utah showed that the steel mill polluted the lake more than all of the open sewage from all of the communities around the lake uh, flowing into it. As recently as the 1950s, raw sewage was also being emptied into Utah Lake and its tributaries, which created public alarm, especially with the polio outbreak in Provo. Wastewater treatment facilities were quickly built and put into operation. But in the minds of those who enjoyed the lake in years past, this was no longer a safe place to swim, fish, or boat. We would still swim in the lake, but we were very cautious about where, you know, where we went to swim. In the 50s, it was about the time when they started to think about sewage treatment plants. And, and actually doing something about the wastes that were going into the lake. And I do believe, uh, from the standpoint of waste going into the lake, we have come a long, long way. For a long time, people failed to recognize what some of their practices were doing to Utah Lake and its fragile ecosystem. It wasn't until the Clean Water Act was passed in the early 1970s that the tide began to turn and environmental regulations came into play. Later, in the 1990s, Geneva Steel undertook a massive cleanup effort on Utah Lake. Millions of dollars went towards efforts to revitalize the area around the lake and improve water quality. But negative perceptions of Utah Lake's condition lingered. Despite all that has been taken from her and the transformation she has undergone, Utah Lake has endured. The lake and the surrounding valley have survived and even flourished in some ways since humans first arrived on her shores. I grew up in Orem, uh, just off Main Street uh, in, the, in the center of town. At that point in time, you could walk outside of your house and go pheasant hunting or do whatever you wanted to do, and there were very few houses around. In fact, I could walk to Utah Lake without um, ever encountering another home. A lot of the heavy industry has left the county now, and so they're not polluting the lake, it's, it's us that are 
polluting the lake. I think that there are a lot of people that are frustrated with the growth they're seeing in our community kind of taking over everything. And they're starting to say that there are things they don't want to see taken over. And one of those is the lake. As population and economic growth were booming in most parts of Utah Valley, impacts to the lake began to be more visible. Very often, change is good, but when non-native fish, such as carp, were introduced to replace the dwindling cutthroat trout, the results weren't good at all. The uh, Utah Lake ecosystem's been, been altered substantially since uh, settlers came to the area. Historically, Utah Lake had 13 native fish species. We had a number of things that we don't have today. The balance that was there at the time the settlers arrived was disrupted uh, because of all the impacts. Of the 13 native fish that originally lived in Utah Lake, only two remain, the June sucker and the Utah sucker. These constitute less than 1% of the overall fish community. Beginning in the 1880s, many exotic and non-native species were introduced to the lake. Some, like eels and clams, did not survive. Others, such as the common carp, which make up an estimated 90% of the lake's biomass, continue to have devastating effects on the lake's ecosystem. We found the lake trout had done poorly because of the low and consequently muddy water. And then the carp, which have thriven immensely, have eaten off the mosses and similar growth along the bottom of the lake, so that the trout have not had enough to eat. Carp are a good deal like the English sparrow. Once they get into a place, they are there to stay. E. A. Tullian, Superintendent of the United States Fish Commission, 1901. Historically, there was quite a lot of vegetation that occurred in the lake and around the shorelines. And uh, since the introduction of uh, carp into Utah Lake, there foraging habits and such has uh, basically eliminated the aquatic vegetation from the lake and uh, increased the turbidity uh, throughout the lake. There are as many perceptions of Utah Lake as there are Utahns. And people continue to ask many things of one body of water. It is a popular recreation spot a sought-after water resource, a magnet for economic boom. So after thousands of years of existence, it seems Utah Lake must continue to be all things to all people. But is this grand dame of the Intermountain West up to the task? What is her ideal use? How can she best serve the communities that rely on her? One of the lake's most unique characteristics is her depth, or lack thereof. Because the lake is shallow, sudden wind bursts and powerful storms easily stir sediment from the bottom of the lake. Aquatic plants help to buffer these effects as their roots anchor lake bottom sediments. However, the feeding habits of non-native carp have caused aquatic vegetation in the lake to die off, and their feeding on the lake's bottom contributes to the water's muddy appearance. Utah Lake's a shallow lake. Its maximum depth's about 15 feet when it's full, and the uh, surface area is about 95,000 acres. Well, w one bad thing about Utah Lake is the people's got it into their heads that this is a, a polluted lake. They figure because it's murky looking, it's pollution. It isn't. It's uh, wind that's causing all this mud. With the complaints about the dirtiness of the, of the water, or the dirty appearance of the water, that, you know, me and my staff, you know, we address that back as this is, this is really shallow. Um, we like to put it in perspective as you, know, you walk up on a mud puddle and you step in it and stomp in it, you know, when you were a kid and did that, you, you made it muddy. And that, in essence, when the wind blows is what it's is like a kid in a small puddle. 
and it's just uh, creating a turbulent atmosphere for it. And it's, it's just is bringing that, that material up and making it float around, giving it a dirty appearance. The biggest issue about them is they're probably much more fragile than deep lakes. And what I mean by that is as soon as a shallow lake gets out of balance, too many nutrients like phosphorus or nitrogen or, or too many fish like carp, what you run into is the possibility of losing oxygen really quickly. In a deep lake, you have a real dark, cold bottom of the lake in which there's lots of oxygen. In a shallow lake, you don't have that. The potential of Utah Lake is both extraordinary and precarious. Her fragile ecosystem hangs in the balance. Although Utah Lake can never be a deep lake, it can once again have clear water with a rich array of plants and a diverse aquatic community. She just needs our help. Socialite, entrepreneur, survivor. This grand old lake has been many things to many people. Above all, she has been a giving lake. Even though she has come a long way from her troubled times, she still has some distance to go. This is evident from the number of species that are listed as threatened or sensitive at Utah Lake including the bald eagle, ute ladies' dresses, and the American white pelican, the Columbia spotted frog, least chub, and the Bonneville cutthroat trout are state-sensitive species. On April 30th, 1986, the June sucker, which is found nowhere else in the world but Utah Lake, was federally listed as an endangered species with critical habitat. June sucker numbers had gone from millions in the 1800s to a natural population of less than 1,000 at the time it was listed. As a result, the June sucker recovery implementation program was formed. While the priority is on June sucker, the recovery program provides a mechanism to protect other species in the Utah Lake drainage basin and will improve the overall health of Utah Lake and its ecosystem. We developed the June Sucker Recovery Implementation Program because a number of agencies felt like that if they worked together with the Fish and Wildlife Service and the environmental community, we could find a way to provide both for the protection of endangered species and to provide water that we need here for the citizens of Utah. The June Sucker Recovery Program was established with two goals. The first goal is to recover the June Sucker so that it no longer uh, requires protection under the Endangered Species Act. And the second goal is to allow the continued uh, development and operation of, of uh, water facilities for the human population. I think one of the unique aspects of this program, and I, I've been involved in a variety of them. I worked with the Puerto Rican government, I worked with the Argentinian government, I worked in New Zealand, uh, I've worked on the Colorado River Recovery Program, and now this June Sucker Program. And, and the thing that strikes me as the most unique about this particular June Sucker Program is they are not doing this with blinders. In other words, they are not so focused on just saving this one fish that they don't care about the rest of it. In fact, this program very much operates under the premise that it's the entire lake ecosystem that we really have to understand in order to basically have this one indicator fish species, that population start to recover. The recovery program is taking a diversified approach by working to address existing threats to the June sucker survival. Although research and monitoring efforts have revealed that June sucker can successfully produce young fish in the Utah Lake system, these young fish rarely make it to adulthood. The focus of the program is to overcome this through a number of actions, such as looking at habitat, or lack thereof, the effects of non-native fish, water flows, and understanding the June sucker better. The program takes a holistic look at the role each plays in the ecosystem. We have several individual elements in the recovery program that include things like uh, non-native fish management, the control of carp, 
Uh, we also have water management where we will try and restore water back into several streams, several tributaries associated with Utah Lake. We will also acquire water that will be stored specifically for June sucker purposes. And the purpose again is to build a better tributary system, a better Utah Lake, and in, in so doing, uh, save the June sucker. The recovery program is conducting research to determine the size of the carp population in the lake. This will allow a better understanding of how to manage the non-native fish population. Other activities include June sucker breeding and stocking programs, genetic testing, and fish tracking and movement studies. Restoring water flows to the Provo River during the spawning season is also an important component as are studies for determining how to restore habitat. One of the challenges in Utah Lake uh, that the program has is restoring aquatic vegetation. And the reason we want to restore that vegetation is it provides a balance to the community. With vegetation restored, it provides cover for young fish so that uh, you have more balanced predator-prey dynamics. It also provides habitat for different types of bugs and insects and smaller fish that historically lived in the lake but don't live there now because the habitat isn't there. Historically, the June sucker played an important role in Utah Lake's ecosystem. They were an integral part of the food chain. June sucker provided a forage base for Bonneville cutthroat trout, fish-eating birds, and other predators. The June sucker can be considered an indicator species. Scientists observe indicator species to monitor how well an ecosystem is functioning. When these species are not doing well, the ecosystem is not functioning as it should. The wild population of June sucker, our latest population estimates put the, the wild population at about 300 individuals. Uh, however, we've been able to introduce a number of fish through our, our stocking efforts. This is part of an ongoing study to look at how small a fish we can stock into the lake and still get survival and, and return to the spawning run. The less time we keep fish in the hatchery, the better adapted they'll be for the wild out in Utah Lake. They won't become domesticated uh, by being fed in the hatchery all the time. They'll learn how to feed themselves in the lake. Plus, it costs a lot less money to raise a two-inch fish than it does to raise an eight-inch fish. So uh, we'd be able to stock actually more fish for the same amount of money. We need to go back and we need to restore fishery to the lake by getting rid of carp. We need to try and find a way to get more water into the lake and down tributaries that are now dry. We need to try and find a way to clean up the water quality of the lake. And so all these things are, are parts of our program. Even though Utah Lake's original pristine state would be nearly impossible to restore, her ecosystem can be enhanced through actions like those being conducted by the June Sucker Recovery Implementation Program. However, this requires a long-term commitment. Over 150 years of impacts have led to her current state, so reversing those impacts cannot occur overnight. But progress is being made. As a result of the recovery program's efforts, there are more June sucker in Utah Lake today than there have been in several decades. In addition, more June sucker enter the Provo River each spring to spawn. Scientists now have a better grasp of how the ecosystem functions. A healthier ecosystem will benefit the public as a whole. And a, a cleaner Utah Lake means that we'll be able to fish it in it, we'll be able to swim, we'll be able to utilize the lake in, in many more ways than we can today. Many people think that the lake is too polluted to use today. And, and so well, we're working on things like water quality, trying to improve the fishing, trying to um, make the lake a better place, not only for the June sucker, but also for the, the people as well, the people who will utilize the lake.
Utah Lake is a reflection of subsistence, abuse, neglect, and restoration. Yet many know that after all she has gone through, Utah Lake is still a precious resource to the communities she has served so well and is worth protecting. What I like about Utah Lake, you come down here and it's peaceful. It just puts a new light on your life to be able to look out on that lake and listen to the birds around the lake. Like right now where I'm retired, it brings back old memories of when I used to spend every day down here practically. I come down to Utah Lake all the time and I'm amazed at uh, how few people use the lake. It's just uh, such a beautiful place and it's so close to such a populated area and it's just such a great place to get away from things. It, it's, in spite of all the impacts that it's had, it's still a very pristine area. It's a great place to take the dog, it, the, the birds uh, for bird watchers are just incredible. It's a great place to go fishing, great place for water skiing. It's, it's just amazing to me that uh, more people don't use the lake itself. And I think the beauty of Utah Lake speaks for itself. And I think if more people came down and started seeing how nice it is down here, they'd, they'd realize that. I've been on Utah Lake since 1972, and I love it because it's a great big body of water, and it's really convenient. I bought a house about a mile from the lake, so I can be on the lake in 10 minutes, and certainly something I'm very passionate about. I, I love the nature and the birds and the animals out here. There's always good days in December and January. We had a day in January this year that was incredible. The whole lake was a mirror and it was warm. When we got done skiing we, and we took our dry suits off, we didn't even put our coats on. And this was January. We come out here on a perfectly calm day when the sun's shining. And, oh, it's, you think you've died and gone to heaven? I love the lake. Uh, it's just a part of me. Whenever I'd walk out of the house, I could see the lake from my house. So the lake was a part of us. The moods were the lake. When the, when the winds had come, when the storms had come up, we'd see them come across the lake. And uh, the sunsets over the lake. And so we could see the sunset every night. Every night was different. By working to balance the needs of the ecosystem with those of the human population, the people along the Wasatch Front will discover the value of being not just residents, but also guardians of their communities. A healthy ecosystem contributes to the greater good of all creatures that depend upon it, including people. We have to be especially careful at this time when we see growth just, you know, continuing to just sprawl in our, in our valleys and in our state. We also have to be prudent stewards of, of what goes on in that lake. There are things that uh, are in a system, ecological system, that have to be able to come into play and they have to be able to do all their different parts. And, and that lake is a critical piece of that. And so as we grow, we've got to make sure that that lake can still continue to function, that that lake can still be preserved and, and, and be what it needs to be to be a part of that whole system. Well, I believe that people who live in Utah understand the principle of stewardship. The need that we have to be responsible for the environment and for the living things that are here on this earth. That they've been given to us and that we need to find a way to take care of them. They are for our use, but at the same time, they're to be used in a wise and prudent way. We have impacted Utah Lake. Clearly, the pioneers came here, and from the time that they first arrived to now, we as humankind have impacted that lake. It's different than what it was when they came. And I think we have an obligation to kind of stop, evaluate, 
where that lake's headed if we don't maybe change our course a little bit. I just would really encourage everyone and anyone, even if they've been out to the lake, you know, in their youth, go out and experience the lake. Go out and get to know the lake. Go out and, and uh, find out what Utah Lake is today. And I would say they're going to have uh, an incredible uh, experience when they do that. Everybody impacts the environment. So everybody has a responsibility to help restore and protect the environment. And this is just one way that we can do it. Treat the earth well. It was not given to you by your parents. It was loaned to you by your children. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. Ancient Indian proverb.